Hi class, we are on to chapter 11 with late adulthood, basically ages 65 and beyond. I'm going to give you an opportunity for an extra credit assignment. After you finish reading through chapter 11, go ahead and respond true or false for the five questions and give me a sentence um, responding why you picked that true or false for each one. Again, it's optional extra credit. Um, and these are some of the topics that are going to be highlighted in some of the stuff that we talk about today. Uh, so chapter 11 goes over physical changes. We've started seeing physical changes in middle adulthood and that's going to continue um, with uh, us living longer um, and having centennials. Those are people who are living to ages 100 and older. We've got several age categories when we get into late adulthood. Um, we'll talk a little bit about life expectancy and quality of life. We will also talk about uh, primary and secondary aging, cognitive development, and hopefully a little bit about relationships. So when we talk about late adulthood, again, we have our young old, old old, and oldest old. So again, we do have different categories as we get into late adulthood um, connected to those different um, age ranges now that we're living longer. When we define late adulthood, again, if we look at our census categories, which we recently had a census this past year, um, you'll see, um, again, a breakdown for the census is identified there. When we think about getting older and into late adulthood, we want to think of how are we aging optimally to live a really high quality, satisfied life. Um, thinking about kind of the normal patterns of aging that are going through. Um, and then also there's cases where we are getting older, but we're having greater impairments. And so that's this idea of impaired aging. Um, the book I go through and discuss a little bit more about how our distribution of the population is changing as we're getting, for example, the baby boomers getting older. So you can review that. Um, globally, we try to look at old age dependency ratio. It's an economics um, breakdown, trying to figure out um, what are the benefits, how can we cover changes as old individuals and older individuals in our population um, are aging and might have more needs. How does having that old age group compared to the rest of the population, um, et cetera. Um, so again, this is kind of going over again, that idea of that economics, old age dependency ratio. If you have a higher number, so you can see 2050, we're gonna have a lot more older individuals. Um, we're going to have, um, possible challenges and changes with that. That could be in terms of careers, working more with careers, working with the aging. Um, it could be changes in workforce development, things like that. Our life expectancy has greatly increased. So in 1900, it was 47 years old. Um, and now we are seeing differences. So I included some data from 2017, the average age being 78 and a half within the US again, but those differences are going to be broken down based on an individual's gender as well as ethnicity. And part of that is coming from just challenges you might have be facing um, as well as possible gender differences in aging and um, what we had talked about in some of the previous chapters in middle adulthood. When we talk about um, late adulthood again, um, one myth is, oh, when you get old, you all, you start to decline, you're miserable, that kind of grumpy old men character. Um, but most individuals report being in good health and being really satisfied with their lives. Um, and we do see relatively few um, older adults in nursing homes. Um, when we look at aging, you can talk about um, primary aging and secondary aging. So primary aging are things that are connected to what's going on with um, our bodies. And so that's going to be your skin wrinkling, your hair turning gray. Um, as we become perhaps more sedentary, there's going to be changes in our weight distribution. The, the compression of our bones is going to cause us to shrink a little bit more. Also, you might have seen changes in posture that could have individuals um, not be as tall as they once were. Uh, we do see problems with possible eye problems. We'll talk a little bit about that in the book, um, as well as hearing loss. Part of that is connected to um, environmental factors that could have impacted your hearing. 
Um, and then the idea of elder speak is changes in the way we might communicate with the older adults. And um, I'll have a slide in that in a minute. Um, so again, there's lots of different changes and some of these changes are gonna be due to um, cultural differences, environmental differences, and things like that. We think about secondary aging. These are things that happen that are connected to aging, but it's not a direct um, result of aging. So um, not everyone is going to face these secondary aging problems where primary aging, everyone has those changes. Um, and so some of those are arthritis, hypertension, um, type 2 diabetes, um, cancer becomes a higher risk factor with older adults, um, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's disease. So again, all of these things we see being more common in old age, um, but not everyone is going to um, face these challenges or when we talk about, there's different theories about why we age. So we do know our cells divide and divide and divide. That limit of once they've stopped dividing is Hayflex limit. Um, we also know that we have telomeres and um, those we see individuals facing more challenges if they have shortened telomeres than longer telomeres. And that's part of that DNA process. Um, there also could be DNA damage from environmental factors. We do see a general decline in our immune system, kind of our um, body's way of kind of winding down. So there's a bunch of different theories. These are all discussed in the book. When we think about aging, sometimes we face aging stereotypes. One of those stereotypes is um, elder speak. So elder speak is not a good thing. It's when you change your communication, ways you communicate because that person is old. You just assume that they don't understand you. You might talk more like a baby. Um, you might kind of dumb down your conversation with that individual or use honey or deer a lot. I realize some people it's kind of a cultural thing to use honey or deer, um, but it's meant um, to be in more of a negative pattern. Um, and then it just causes a lot of confusion. There's a lot of functioning older adults and if they, here they are being talked to like a child or a baby or they're being talked to differently, um, it really can impact their, their self, their understanding of themselves. So it's something to avoid. Um, and it's unfortunately something I, I'll see. I'll see it at the bank, I'll see it at the grocery store. Um, so again, it's based on stereotypes, the assumption that you might see this older person looking frail, but that still doesn't mean they're, they're, they're could be there, definitely there cognitively. Um, and so I'd say, first rule of thumb, when you're working with an older adult, talk to them normally. And then if you see body language or their communication is that they don't understand you, then you can change the way you're communication, communicating with them. But don't go with the assumption that, oh, I've got to talk like a baby or talk like a child to this person, because it really does. It erodes their self-esteem and they're feeling like, why is this person talking to me like this? I'm a competent adult. What's going on here? We do see some changes with cogn cognition as we get old, um, older. So one thing in general, because we have some changes in memory, sometimes older adults can have low self uh, memory efficacy, basically feeling like, oh, I'm not going to remember that. Oh, I'm not good at that. Um, don't have, don't ask me about those things. I'm not good at that task. And, and so they realize that memory has changed and then they're, they're not feeling so great about it. Um, we do have differences in, um, you do have general declines in attention, attentional abilities. Some of those are changes with sensory changes. So I might not see as well, I might not hear as well. So then that's gonna impact my attention. Um, we also see working memory decline, fluid intelligence decline, which is connected to working memory. Um, we might also see um, source memory decline. That's this idea of, did I hear it on the radio? Did I see it on television? Was it in a dream? Um, did my spouse tell me this? Um, how did I, where did I come up with this information? We do typically see your semantic memory, which is kind of your knowledge memory is resistant to decline as well as procedural memory. And that's like how to drive, how to ride a bike, um, those things that are kind of like are already automated. 
with working memory again, working memory deficits, we all face this, but sometimes you have a blip in your working memory and you all of a sudden forgot what you were saying or forgot what you were doing or why did I open the fridge? Those kinds of things become more frequent. Um, if you're concerned with an older adult and memory changes, I would ask yourself, is that getting in the way of functioning in their day-to-day -day life? Are they forgetting things that could do them harm or um, someone else harm or it's unsafe? That could be a issue where you um, have challenges with um, what's normal and what's not with memory. And I have a handout for that in the modules. Um, we do also see that um, we could have health factors that implicate our um, changes in memory. So we do know there's a connection with oxygenation in the brain. So anytime you have things that could impact that, like smoking or high blood pressure or not getting a lot of exercise or blood, throw, blood flow for the body, all of those things um, are related to those individuals having poor memory. We also know if you are feeling crappy about your memory, low self-efficacy, that's not going to be helping you. That's going to be kind of clogging out your abilities to process things efficiently. Um, I do have this quick little um, connection. Again, I'm going to offer this as part of that extra credit along with those true-false questions. Um, so again, ab abnormal loss would be having severe memory issues. So it could be dementia. It could be Alzheimer's specifically. Um, it could also be things that are um, going on that have symptoms of memory loss. So that could be depression, um, that could be alcohol. It could actually also be mixing medications. Sometimes they don't play well together, then that impacts the individual's memory. Um, we also see linkages to poor nutrition. Um, I've got a video for you guys that watches a little bit more about Alzheimer's. It's the most common form of dementia. Again, not everyone gets Alzheimer's. It is when you're getting this plaque and neurofibrillary tangles that kind of mush up your brain and then make it harder for you, those individuals to process. There's different stages of dementia. Um, there's a video link on Alzheimer's. Um, and there is some very quick screening that's typically done with a physician's office before a referral is made. So we're now gonna move on to some of the physical development or psychosocial development. And so this is our last theory of Erickson, or is the last stage of Erickson's theory. It's integrity versus despair. Uh, this is when you're looking back at your life and you're trying to feel like, am I fulfilled? Did I do a lot? Did I make a place in the world? Am I finding meaning? If so, I'm going to um, end my life peacefully and I feel like I have a strong integrity versus not feeling that way and um, having those last stages of life feeling in despair. So again, with Erickson, you have those two different kinds of sides and each stage you progress and, with, and lead out in one or the other. So this is our last stage, integrity versus despair. Here's one more extra credit question for you that kind of connects back to Erickson. As we get older, we decide Hmm, this isn't worth the hassle or the fuss, or I don't want to put up with this person's negativity or bad mindset. And we prioritize with the idea that life is short. So let's stay engaged with people we enjoy and things we enjoy. And I'm going to be careful choosing my social obligations and I'm going to do things I like. I'm going to be around people I like. So again, this idea of prioritizing my social relationships and getting the most out of life now that I'm in my late adulthood. When we uh, decide to retire, for most Americans is between 60 and 65. Part of that's gonna be dependent on government offerings. The later you wait in retirement, the higher social security benefits you can get. So the earliest you can retire is 62. And then there's another payoff, I guess, at 67 and then at 72. And so you've got to balance that. You've got to balance what other savings you have. You've got to balance your job satisfaction. Is there something else you want to be doing instead of work? And then as well as thinking about your health, your family's health, your family that's going on. Uh, and again, thinking about what's going on with employment. And hopefully that's something where it's a positive thing that you have decided to retire and it's not a situation of forced retirement. 
again, thinking about how you're framing retirement is definitely going to determine that outlook of positive or negative retirement. Uh, older adults is a time to be really productive. Um, older adults have an opportunity to build a lot of relationships. There's also a lot of relationship changes. Review these last.